Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 133 of Small Business War Stories. And this is a great one. I sat down with Amy D. and Daniel Walker of D's Country Cocktail Lounge in Nashville, Tennessee. And what's interesting is basically Amy started this venue uh, because she got to Nashville and what she wanted to see wasn't there. So... A lot. That's a theme. A lot of folks that I talked to on the show wanted to see something in the world, looked around, it wasn't there. So there's two options. You either, you know, lament the fact that it's not there or you go create it. So what they did is they created a really awesome vibe down home um, country cocktail bar with uh, live music all the time in Madison, Tennessee, which is right outside, right northeast of Nashville, Tennessee, and they've had, uh, I mean, I don't want to steal their thunder, they talk a lot about different folks that come in there uh, that you've probably heard of, and uh, the vibe that they're creating there, and the community they're creating with their venue, Uh, and uh, so yeah, a lot of fun here, Um, I ended up actually playing a show there, uh, you know, a couple days after that, and uh, it was a great time. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Gusto. <clears throat> and if you wonder why we have sponsors, it's to keep the lights on in the podcast. And we appreciate it when you support our sponsors. And Gusto is G-U-S-T-O. And it is a company that helps you with keeping track of things like payroll and uh, your benefits for your employees. And also, um, you know, other things that are paying to do. Uh, and if you put yourself in the shoes or if you are a business owner that is starting a business, usually you don't start a company, unless you're masochistic, to deal with things like payroll and benefits. So there are companies like Gusto. Go check them out, go sign up. It's a G-U-S-T-O slash war stories. And when you sign up and you run your first payroll, you get three free months. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Amy D. and Daniel Walker of D's Country Cocktail Lounge in Madison, Tennessee. And we are live here in beautiful Madison, Tennessee. And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Amy D. and Daniel Walker of D's Country Cocktail Lounge. And it's really, really cool to be here. Awesome establishment. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, I found out about you guys, uh, this artist I really appreciate. Uh, C.W. Stone King is playing here. And, and I dug a little bit more into what you guys are doing. And I thought it was really cool because you're almost bringing, you're bringing a very um, <clears throat> old school, organic uh, sensibility to uh, what's a relatively new bar, right? When, how long have you guys been around? We'll be three years old in October. Okay, three years old. Mm-hmm. So how did this come about? What, what was the inspiration to start this? Uh, I hung out with Andy Gaines a lot. He owns Mickey's Tavern. So I became friends with him. And uh, we would drive around Madison trying to find just something that resembled a cool dive bar. And everything just seemed uh, just pretty sketch and not fun. <laughs> and there's, or there's, you know, there's chain restaurants and things. And there's a, a couple places that get live music. But for the most part, for the kind of things that I guess I was looking for. It was all in East Nashville. Okay. And when I moved here and I was sitting at Five Spot one night, it was so strange. I hadn't been here long, but I'd been to several places. And I asked all my friends, I'm like, where is there a country bar? I'm like, oh, you know, there's, you know, the bars downtown. I'm like, but that's not a country bar. Those are honky tonks. Honky tonks, That's right. not just like an old school, just a regular bar where yeah. there's country music on the jukebox. Yeah. There's cold beer. With Waylon, and, Willie, and, and Yeah, and no one had it. Yeah. And it just struck me as bizarre. So... It just became like Andy and I driving around and like getting in this mission. And then we stumbled across this property and just, it just took off from there. 
That is awesome. That is awesome. And you, so we are here in Madison, which is very close to East Nashville. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, what is it, like an eight-minute drive or something like oh, that, yeah. right? So, they, so would you consider Madison a part of that kind of like East Nashville community, or is it like a separate thing? It was separate for, it was considered separate for a long time. But okay. at this point, I think with the gentrification of East Nashville, a lot of us have moved up to this deeper, higher parts of Inglewood and into Madison. And it's kind of just become its own, like... People travel between East Nashville and Madison, and it's, we're still our okay. own thing, but we still have a lot of our people from over there that live up here now. Awesome. Now, I want to get a little bit deeper into the roots of this. You have been all over the place. Uh, you have <laughs> spent a lot of time in a lot of different places. <laughs> I learned this from I a have. combination of the conversation we had before we started rolling and some prior shows you've done before. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more. You are a true rambler. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I was born and raised in Chicago, and I had the opportunity to move to New York um, when I was 22, right before I turned 23. And I figure, I mean, well, why would I stay here? And if it doesn't work out, I could always come back. But it was the late 90s, and the option of New York just seemed too good to pass up. And I'm staying there for a long time. And then I thought I would get out and try and live in Las Vegas for a minute with a friend of mine. Boom. And holy... Holy hell, that was the worst decision I made when I turned 30. And I didn't stay there long. I was only there for a couple months. And then I moved back to Chicago. Got it. Stayed there for a few years, went back to New York for a second round of madness. And then um, I got to a point where I was like, I got to get out of here. I need a better quality of life. And then my friend won um, uh, Best Chef of the Year, Food and Wine. And I knew him from Chicago like, you know, 20 years ago. So he convinced me to come down and visit, and I came down here, and I was like, wow, I don't have to deal with harsh winters. It's warmer, and it's not as crazy as New York. Yeah. And the quality of food and the dining scene and what I was doing in New York was, at that point, like the same caliber was coming here. So I mm-hmm. figured the quality of life was outstanding. I could make the same or similar kind of money I made in New York, but my overhead would be cut, and my stress would be moderate to none. You're right. Yeah, no, I, that, that's actually a big theme that I found in the, you know, driving around the country. A lot of people actually uh, find, either, either do what you did, which is find a place that really speaks to their soul, that has a lower cost of living, and they go there. Or another that, uh, trend that I've seen is like the, what I call the great rehoming, which is people leave. Uh, there's a guest that I can think of in Tulsa, Oklahoma, does leave with the, he left, went to LA, became a musician and a guitar maker, and then moved back to Tulsa. And, uh, it's established there now, right? So that's kind of something that, that I've seen a lot of. And, and people kind of go to these big cities, but then end up coming back. Uh, well, as far as like coming back here? Yeah, yeah. No, well, not necessarily. You, you, you're, you're not from here originally. Yeah, yeah. But you also are seeking a you know, higher quality of life and lower cost of living. And here you have an opportunity to really leave your imprint on the community, right? And it, that's a big It deal. was because it, uh, it took me, I mean, three years, almost to the exact day that I moved here to open D's. Wow. Because it was great, because, I mean, a lot of people are, uh, I don't know, can see an opportunity, but there's not a whole lot of hustle in yeah. some people. So I saw things, I'm like, snoozing on things. I'm just yeah. going to start taking, like, do what I can. So That's awesome. I saw opportunities to grow and keep moving and try and get that vision. Yeah, so let's talk about the space. So this space currently has that. Yeah, it's, it's a very southern, you know, sensibility in terms of, uh, you know, I've been, I've been to places in... Uh, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, this reminds me of Texas, certainly. Uh, and, and I'm sure that's not an accident. So tell me a little bit more. What did this space look like when you found it? And now it's got, you know, it's got the pool table and we have, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, there, there's a lot, a lot of different beers. Actually, I saw Montucky Cold Snacks. They're also a past guest in the show. Oh, those are and great. It's a great company. Yeah, I love in, those guys. In Livingston, Montana. That was, that was really funny. We, we didn't, we're not sober during that podcast and it shows. We started talking about all kinds of funky stuff. <laughs> so if, you, if you're bored, go check that one out. Uh, but yeah, tell me more. So what did you, you found the space, what did it look like? Um, it was, uh, it looked very different. They had a digital jukebox kind of like right where that was. Um, they had a couple of those golden tea yep. games and so it, was, it, like it a, was a bar. Right? It was a bar okay. before, but it was just a beer bar. It was a smoking beer bar, like heavy. It's like the cobwebs were brown from the tar. Like it was nice. It was just a, it was, yeah, it was just a, it was just a little beer joint behind the porn store that no one knew was here. Cause there's like the beer joint behind the porn store. Yeah. That <laughs> that's, a it. Good, that's a good name for a song. <laughs> if nobody's ever written that. They should. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we found it. And, uh, I just, well, for me first and foremost, I was like, I have to get that smell out of here. Yeah. And then how do I make it look homey and welcoming? 
Yeah. So, you know, growing up in the 80s, you could still take your kids to bars. So I would go to a bunch of bars, you know, in the summer with my parents. We'd, you know, go see my great uncle and we'd go to all these different bars in Wisconsin. And they all kind of looked, you know, similar and the same, where it was like all looked familiar and welcoming. Um, but, you know, they kept, they kept it clean. And they just offered, you know, they, they a solid jukebox in most of the places and cold beer. And there was, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, Wisconsin food was available. And what were the things that were important to you? So one of the things uh, you, you said earlier, you were looking for a specific type of bar and you couldn't find it, right? So a lot of uh, people I interview are, they get started that way because they're basically scratch their own itch. And what are the things that you wanted to make sure that this had to, to make it that? Um, well, I want it to be a, a, a clean and safe environment with an awesome music selection on the jukebox okay. where it wasn't just country, but I was very, in the beginning, very adamant about um, things of like a specific era. I didn't really want a whole lot of music past like mid 70 or yeah. 80 on there. Yeah. Um, and definitely that with the country music. Yeah. And you don't want any bro country in there either. No. Okay. So Absolutely Luke, not. Luke like, I don't even want people, I don't, I don't, I don't want people covering those songs here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone's got their thing. This is just ours. <laughs> Sounds good. So yeah, God bless. You got it. You got yeah, yeah. And as you know, in um, that movie Nashville, my partner Andy really was struck by that, um, that graphic so we had that redesigned that was you know the old exit in is where that movie was filmed so you know we got the inspiration to put up you know that guitar neck around the stage and orange was very much a popular color i just color. noticed that that is a guitar <laughs> neck that wraps <laughs> around it wraps around the stage wow that's very cool that's yeah and it, it looks really cool and i was trying to find you know the right colors and how it uh, what would make people feel comfortable right upon coming in you know there's a warm welcoming bar right by the door the bartender has the opportunity you know to greet people and yeah. you just keep it at one pool table. We finally got some dartboards in. Um, all the things I think people just want to uh, be comfortable in a bar and yeah, that makes sense. Have some fun. And some of the elements that we got were from Dan. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, I just thought as soon as uh, she started describing some of the things in the bar that yeah. we'd be amiss if we didn't uh, give a little shout out out to my family because some of the like the decorations, like the deer antlers that, yeah. are, that are hanging around. That's from my stepdad. And then you can see the little um, kooky-eyed uh, bobcat that hangs Charlie above Bob. the bar. That's Charlie Bob. Okay. Um, and that was actually uh, That is from a real bobcat up there. He's yeah. Too. I'm from discovering a lot of new things just by sitting here and looking <laughs> around a little bit more. <laughs> you can keep doing that for hours yeah. if you look long enough. But, yeah. um, you know, we've got lots of, um, you know, photos from people that are important in the community that have... Um, even a couple that have passed on that have been so important in East Nashville and Madison. And, uh, but the Bobcat came from my little brother, um, who had it all growing up. And, um, and then there's other different like signs that, uh, not just from beer distributors and things, but from people that have been like, Hey, this, I really, I don't have a place for this. And I know you guys would really enjoy it. Hell yeah. Um, so it's really special the way the decorations have built over time. And, um, it kind of adds to the warm atmosphere that Amy has been able to kind of cultivate from the beginning and sh the the bar that we're sitting or the floor that we're sitting on right now is one that she put down pretty much single-handedly wow. um as a dance floor and so uh, a lot of a lot of time went into uh opening this place and then it's continued to grow yeah um, this place feels like a legend in the making you just got to keep it up <laughs> i'll tell you it was <laughs> really cool it is. <laughs> yeah exactly that's awesome so can you think of a time where somebody gave you a decoration and you're like ah this is great but no thanks don't call them out by name. But. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I've given some things, and they just kind of like a little kitschy or store-bought or made to look old. Or, yeah. Um, this not really with what we had, but I'd find ways of just like, you know, hanging some things for a while. There you go. And then like, rotate it out because I got to, you know, put someone else's or I found something else I wanted to put up. That makes sense. That makes sense. Or I stash some things like in my shed. Probably like, well, my next bar, I'll definitely put it up. There you go. <laughs> You're going to start a chain. <laughs> <laughs> These are the brand. There you go. Is that how you think about it? You want it to be a brand? You want it to be something that... I mean, yeah, actually, that's a great question. What, how, do you, how do you go about thinking about that? Oh, my God, absolutely. I mean, it's hard to replicate the Ds that we have here because just musically... There are only like, so many porn stores. There's yeah. only so many porn stores you could be parked behind in a triple-wide trailer, mm -hmm. which is what we are. But our, our music talent in Nashville is it's 
There are so there's it, we're saturated with amazing people. Yeah. So we get opportunities for really cool people to play here. So everyone's like, oh, open a D somewhere else, and it doesn't. It, it just necessarily won't easily translate oh, in a different city, you because mean. you know we right. you can go to any other city, but you're not going to have well, Austin, the Austin all those other same. people like right at hand. But we do definitely would love to to grow. Yeah, we're in in love with Puerto Rico. So is that right? Oh my God, so in love with it. D's Caribbean cocktail lounge. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. It's something you already thinking there, about it. There's definitely been some talk, you know, it, it would be, it would be way in the future, but, um, and then we, you know, we've even joked around with our friends who visited from New York, but, uh, um, my friend's wife was from Austria. Yeah. And so like D's Aus, which is like D's East out in Eastern Europe. <laughs> so, there you, go. you know, it's, it's fun to dream. Yeah. Well, you could also have another one in a different part of Nashville too, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. Something a little more along the lines of yeah. what people would do to expand their brand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just a little yeah. simpler maybe yeah. to start. <laughs> but it's fun to dream. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the things that people don't know about that are uh, maybe both amazing and really challenging about having a place like this? You know, I, because opening a bar is so sexy, right? But I'm sure there's got to be a whole bunch of hidden it was, things. It didn't feel sexy when I was in here in August and trying not to run the power because I have no money. It's a, trying to keep my costs down and get this bar open on this shoestring budget that I had and sign this floor. But I think it's, I think part of my current challenge now is how do we maintain not charging a cover charge every day because we have music every day. Yeah. And you have some amazing people. Yeah, and, and so the, the cost of music, try, trying to keep that part of our overhead down and still trying to remain fair, especially to our regulars who have been here from the beginning. Right. Just ask them to start paying a cover charge every time they come. So trying to figure out creative uh. ways to help with your overhead, like a, I put a band tab fee on people's credit cards when the music starts and it's only two dollars mm. so it's two bucks gets added to your tab so that helps me cover my cost for the sound guy which i try not to put but well, we try not to put that uh cost onto the bands right because most places you know get to pay pay for the sound guy and then you know you get your door so we're like well we hustle a lot of tips yeah to yep. help cover that and there's always things that are needing to be replaced or fixed around here. Yeah. And so that's always a challenge. Um, and then it's really just trying to keep, like she said, uh, all the customers happy, um, the bands happy. The, it takes a long time to build a reputation and a lot of credibility as far as what we offer for bands. And so keeping to where we don't have a production fee for the bands and just expect them to promote and uh, bring in people that then can tip them in lieu of a cover charge and try to keep it where it's like that neighborhood bar slash live music venue that um, people can come here to see the band or just to hang out yeah and enjoy their friends and you you do the booking right Dan? that's right that's what i mainly spend my time on is um finding uh fielding all the emails i'm mostly in a reactive mode yeah. trying to make well, it's sure a high quality problem it is a good problem to have yeah. where everybody's wanting to play. And it took a long time to do that and find the right um, music that worked for the room. And sometimes, um, you know, you, you, you have hit or miss things that happen. Um, but um, what, are, what are some of those stories there? Well, you know, one thing that I was uh, that happened recently was I, I, I usually, you know, and wisely so um, listen to the music whenever somebody hits me up. But sometimes, you know, you just have a friend of a friend that and you're like, well, I like that friend and, and yeah. I want to help them out by helping their friends out coming through town. And I didn't realize it was like a real heavier act. Oh. Um, but they were really cool. The guy was really nice. And I wish I could remember the band name right now on the spot. But they were, yeah. they were from New York. And the guy actually, actually had like kind of a, I don't know if it's the right word to use for it, but it was like a screamo type voice. Yeah. But they were here for hours before they played and hung out and were the kindest folks. And when they got up, they did kind of like a semi unplugged set and people loved it because that's the good thing about this bar is even if it's not their style of music, people like appreciate good music yeah. and they played to the room and people loved it. So you, what's your process? You, somebody pitches you, Hey, I'd love to play there. Then you, you listen to their stuff. Well, how does that, what, what do you, I like to see that they have some kind of online presence that they're active, you know, and, and have some kind of following. Um, because just because they play good music doesn't mean anybody's going to come out or if they don't know about them yet. Yep. So, um, some sort of following and then some sort of sense that they've, um, they're not just starting out all the time, although it is a good idea. I think to bring in all types of 
of artists if you can as far as the experience goes yeah. so we have a Wednesday night where um, I try to avoid monikers like writer's night and writer's round and things like that but we have a songwriter showdown oh nice where people can play two songs oh maybe I'll come uh, this Wednesday night please do that'd be great yeah, and to, then um, and then on Monday nights um, instead of having another kind of songwriter thing um, it's called Madison Guild and it is kind of like a songwriter night but it's really left open where from 8 30 to 11 30 you know you can have a band and like tonight there's a instrumental pedal steel band that's playing kind of to open it up and yeah. last week there was an instrumental steel band as well wow it's just kind of random like that's that awesome. but really trying to just keep everybody happy on both sides and um, as far as me selecting the music um, it almost the D's kind of tells me what what it needs, yeah. um, and I try to just follow along with what, what's play, happening. You, before it started rolling, so you play a slide guitar too. Do you ever play or no? Yeah, I, I try not to book myself too often. <laughs> that would be weird. But um, on on Wednesday afternoons now, I used to play Friday afternoons with a band, and now I have Wednesday afternoons, which is when Amy bartends, and so it's nice to kind of keep it all in the family on Wednesdays. And, yeah. Um, and then, like some, some every once in a while, there's a weekend slot that's open. So yeah. I think I'm playing this Friday night, and I haven't played on a weekend in a long time. There so you go. Just like to well, keep it spaced it's, it's out. Once in a while, it's okay, right? Yeah, yeah. once. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't bartend all the time. You bartend some of the time. No, I've been bartending <clears throat> a long time since '97. Okay. So now I'm at the point where I could finally not have to bartend as much. So yeah. I've, I've whittled it down to a just Wednesday. Just Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, I'm here Got from it. 3 to 8, and then and that's, that's it. And that's how you said you met. So Margot Price, you said, is an artist uh, whom we all appreciate. You oh, my God, yeah. She's, her. her and her husband are so awesome. Yeah, they've become friends of ours. Has she ever played here or not? She yeah. has. She's, she's sang and she's performed, you know, with, with, uh, with our friend Darren. Okay. I think it's the first time she sang, and I think that was, like, right near – Thanksgiving, like not too long after we open, like yep. almost right after. Um, and I mean, it's not on a bill or anything, but she'll come in and sit in and sing a song or two every once in a while. That's awesome. Yeah, she's amazing. I saw her at Willie Nelson's ranch inside of Willie Nelson's chapel, which is probably about half the size of this room that we're in right now. Was that during, uh, was that the post South by kind <laughs> of thing? It was during, yeah, during yeah. South by every year, uh, but it was during luck reunion. You going to get me into that next year? Uh, sure. Great. I mean, well, Matt Beiser <laughs> is, uh, and L.A. <laughs> Fletcher, they were past uh, guests of the show. I've heard about that party for years. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you make it too awesome for South by? No. I have years ago. I, mean, I can't guarantee, but Matt, if no. you're listening, I'm not guaranteeing anything. I'll introduce <laughs> you guys. Yeah, I'm just joking around. Yeah. That's awesome, though. That's really cool that you saw her there. <laughs> I've never made it, but I've wanted to. Yeah. I no, think she thought about but moving to Austin and um, at one point before I left New York the first time. Right. But then I broke my wrist and I just like, oh, I can't do that. I've never been there. I have other things to worry about. And that was before Austin took off. So I kind of wondered like, wow, had I gone there? Could these yeah. have opened sooner in Austin? I don't know. Well, I, I mean, we don't want to get too much into Austin, but people always think that, you know, 10 years ago was the best time ever to be in Austin. Well, that's what they say about Nashville, too, I'm sure. for sure, or just about anywhere, probably, where it used to be cool. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people who moved to Austin in the 80s said that it was, it was all done, like, in, in the 70s, we really wouldn't that's want to be there. <laughs> that's right. So that's that's like, about right. <laughs> that's awesome. So how do you, uh, we talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, the community here. You talked about the East Nesvillian, which is a magazine that covers kind of what's going on in the art scene here and, you know, in this part of town. Right. What, how do you interact with the community? Who, what are some other businesses and, and other ways in which you uh, interact with the, you know, either other businesses or I, I don't know? What, how do you relate to the community? Well, Amy's always been really good about making sure that she uh, makes everybody feel safe and welcome here, all types. And um, we've had a lot of um, politicians actually have some um, benefits here and um, thrown some benefits. Uh, we, one event that we had for our one year anniversary was with Elizabeth Cook and I think our um, charity cook there was a chili cook off and um, it was a really big day, really a lot of fun. Elizabeth Cook was the host the whole mm -hmm. time and uh, that was to also benefit the Pet Community Center. No, wasn't that was, that was uh, the Music Cares. Music Cares. Music Cares. We, uh, yeah, or the Music Health Alliance Music was Health the one. Alliance, that, yeah, for the was it the Ben I Stone uh, uh, Foundation? That was coming into play too that day. Yeah, yeah. which is an awesome uh, foundation to kind of help musicians cover uh, medical expenses yeah. and get them the medical treatment they need when they don't have the insurance. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. There's one in Austin called Ham Health Alliance for awesome musicians. Awesome. Some of that. So just really trying to make sure that we're not only being a part of the community, but also trying to lift up the community and. Um, make sure that pe this is also a place where people can gather, not just to drink and have a good time, but to um, 
find supporters for their causes and, and raise some money for good causes overall. Yeah. Yeah. Our second year we did a, a fundraiser for, a, or that they were our, you know, the uh, pet community center. That's who we raised money for. And they just, it's a nonprofit. And uh, we, so we chose them for the second year. Yeah. And it's just, uh, always just trying to make sure that everyone is treated uh, fairly and equally. You know, you, you want to make everyone happy and it's just not possible all yep. the time. But I, for sure, definitely, it was uh, making it clear when we opened what sort of crowd we did not want and who would be welcome. I know that part of what... Um, so that's interesting. Hold on. So yes. you, you say you want to welcome <laughs> a lot of people except for some people. <laughs> well, I wanted to ex- explain that because it makes sense if... Uh, I always like to bring up how Amy wisely chose to and still does not carry Jaeger oh, or wow. Red Bull or Fireball. Interesting. Um, explain why. Why is that, Amy? <laughs> I will say from all the years of bartending, yeah. the things that have rounded up that fires up the biggest group of knuckleheads are those three beverages. Oh. Because you don't see like people like fist pumping like, yeah, let's do seven shots of Jim Beam. Yeah. No, no <laughs> one's doing that. Like, let's do fireball and it's sweet. And then before you know it, you went from being like kind of fun looking cute in your outfit to being a disaster like in the bathroom on the floor yeah making some poor that decisions that is really interesting <laughs> how so how the choice of what you serve affects who shows up yeah i i, I definitely eliminated uh, the younger knucklehead demographic with that so the younger people that do hang out here are here for the music and for like the community feel it kind of feels like a, a public house here because you know we have two rules at d's you have two to have rules. money to pay your tab okay. and you cannot be an asshole and that's like my blanket statement you know like you're racist, xenophobic, got some whatever baggage you're carrying is yeah. not what we want to do. Go deal be nice to everyone. Else. Yeah, so I have enough money to pay your tab. That's, that one's important. It's important. Some people forget about that. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> you have to remind them kindly. <laughs> Every once in a while. 86 slip. <laughs> <laughs> and we take a quick break in our conversation here with our guests to talk about our sponsor, Gusto. That's a G U S T. T-O. And Gusto helps you keep track and helps you keep things like payroll and benefits and all your tax withholding straight. And it's really, these are things that are important to run your business. Uh, you know, I ran a business for 10 years and as soon as I could, I hired somebody to uh, help me make sure that those things were all taken care of because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort to make sure that those things um, are working. And it's uh, for legal and for business reasons, and you, you need to make sure that that works. So go check out Gusto. That's G-U-S-T-O slash War Stories. And when you sign up and run your first payroll, they'll give you three free months. This is also a good time to remind you that if you enjoy this episode, please share it with one friend. So go ahead and send them over uh, to smallbusinesswarstories.com or to their favorite podcasting platform. And we'll get back now to the conversation with Amy and Daniel. Wow, that's interesting. So so let's talk about what you do serve. So you serve, I saw you have, so you probably have Montauki Cold Snacks. Again, past, oh, yeah. past guests of the show and Livingston, you guys are awesome. And uh, I saw you have some Shiner, which is, uh, you know, Texas, uh, Texas beer. And you have, you said you're from Chicago and that's why you have the old style. So old style is like for our, our guests who may not, I mean, our, our uh, listeners may not know is kind of like, the PBR of specifically like Chicago Wrigley, and Wisconsin, yeah, Chicago, uh, Wisconsin too. Okay. Oh yeah, for I sure. Was the, only, the the place where I saw Old Star everywhere is right outside of uh, Wrigley uh, Wrigley Field, right? Yeah, because so. Pabst, uh, I think they Pabst makes it. Um, is that right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was like, well, I'm gonna open a bar, and I have memories of going to bars with my dad growing up. So you serve Old Star here too. Huh? Oh, yeah, for sure. So oh, I carry wow. Old Style and Seagram 7 because that's what my dad liked to drink. Nice. And then we have Chicago-style Italian beefs. So I go back to my Chicago roots yeah. and where, you know, I was inspired to open D's from the kinds of bars of that. Awesome. Um, but then I also brought in uh, elements of the, the really nice restaurants I worked at in New York and the kind of things they carried. So I carry yeah. a couple of different types of Amaro. So if someone's real sad about Jaeger, I'm like, well, we've got Fernet. Yeah. And Ramazzotti. For I do drink Fernet. <laughs> and Amaro and Montenegro. Fernet, yeah, Fernet's, uh, <laughs> Fernet's a little bit of uh, uh, the dark horse of, uh, of of drinks. I've recently heard it's the bartender's handshake. Isn't that right? Oh, I hear it. It is. I just, I just, I, I, I personally can't stand it. I really like. I just, it. yeah, I, I just. I like weird flavors like that. Too. 
It's just a, it's a little better for me. I like other Amaros. Okay, there you go. I'll drink it if I have to. Get right. the peer pressure to be really cool and have the cool bartender shot. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Okay, so that that brings in the right the right kind of crowd. Yeah, um, and we have like a, a nice whiskey selection. And though we don't have a ton of gin drinkers, when we do get our gin drinkers, we have a really a, a, a very small boutique selection of it. Boom. There you go. So. I'm sure that in three years, you have not been able to completely avoid the knuckleheads. How do you handle it when something happens at your bar that you're like, I don't want this to happen at my bar? What do you do? It's, it's all situational, depending. Yeah. Sometimes it's just literally grabbing someone by the shoulders, spinning them around and pushing them out the front door. Sometimes it's a talking to. It just really depends on, you know. Yeah. And, and the level of urgency with that individual at that moment. Yeah. And, you know, how, all the how, factors that play into it. Well, how much alcohol they had? Is right. there anything else involved? Uh, Can we do this as nicely as possible? There's been all kinds of uh, incidents here, but not very many physical incidents, really. There hasn't been really a bar fight, per se. Uh, yeah. A couple of people have tried to get physical, and they the staff has been... Bars first, and they were drinking probably Fireball, and then came <laughs> here and started the fight with our guys at the pool table. Really? Or something small like that. But it's over quickly and they're out. But yeah, yeah we're not a, that kind of bar at all. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty rare. And um, as far as... You, you, um, were, you were on security here? You're you know, it's funny. We, we rarely even have a door person. Okay. Um, there's been times when we've talked about how maybe, um, you know, having somebody on the weekends and, and, and that kind of thing is good. And we definitely, um, you know, we have a bartender and a bar back and they support each other and kind yeah. of watch over what's going on. But really, uh, it's almost like our regulars sometimes act as the bouncers in a way. Like yeah. when somebody's really being a jerk, um, you can see five or six people rounding up um, to say, hey, this, you don't do this here. This is a good time place, and everybody's here to have a good time and, yeah. and, be, and be nice and, and, and have fun. So it's really the vibe that pervades, and so we've been lucky that way. Yeah. Um, and it takes a lot from what Amy's been able to uh, cultivate from the beginning. That's awesome. And you said, to tell me a little bit more about this process of ramping up your place in the community to where now you have a lot of inbound interest of people playing here because – the the fact that Nashville has so many musicians is kind of like a double-edged sword, right? So you have, on the one hand, a lot of people, but on the other hand, a lot of venues right. and a lot of competition for people's attention and time. Uh, and so how did you get, uh, uh, you know, the artists that you want to show up here and the community and the people that you wanted to come see those acts to show up? Right, that's a great question. I mean, it is... Um two sides like you said where there's a lot of musicians but then a lot of places to play yeah. um, and it took a long time and we started out with just two nights of music where we just had music Friday and Saturday oh. and it just it, it dictated over time that we needed to have a little more music um, here and there and we yeah. filled in the nights slowly uh, we still have Sunday nights where there's no music at all just to give a little break and a little place for people to hang out on one night a week where there's no music even though we have a Sunday brunch where we have some, some music during the day okay. um, so uh, finding those artists, um, they started coming to us once they once the word got out of what we were doing. Yeah. And I think they enjoy having a nice low key place to play. A lot of big artists play here, and they enjoy not having the big setup and the big t uh, production that happens with some of the bigger venues. And the, we just had Chuck Mead come through mm -hmm. with his little honky talk tour, and he played a lot of the cool smaller rooms. And we were really happy to be included That's in awesome. that, and it was really fun. And we had some people say that it sounded really good here um, and because we've worked really hard to build up the sound system over time. Where yeah. Now we have sub Well, no, I, I haven't heard the sound system kit. yet, but I do think that the, all the wood and the way that you design, like the shape of the, the place and the wood, based on my limited experience playing venues, seems like it would really lend it, have like a very warm sound to it. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the the rectangular nature of the triple wide doesn't lend itself well to like really loud guitars. So sometimes that can be a problem. But oh. but over time, we've done I think a good job of making sure that it's um, it's it's interesting the way the the bar is set up. We're sitting here um, in front of the stage, and you can see the speakers. They point out just on this side of the room. And there's been times we've talked about how maybe we have some more speakers pointing over there. But I think it's nice where if you want to really hear the music, you can be you on can this side of the here. bar. And then if you want to have a conversation with your friend, yeah. you can sit there at the uh, main bar yeah. near, the, near the front door. And you can also go outside to the beer garden and hang out too. So there's different zones where if you're here for the music, you can be right up close or yeah. you can kind of enjoy it on the side or you can go outside and take a break and not be listening to 
to that, that at all. So lots of different places for people to go. As you were working your way uh, up, did you do a lot on social media? I mean, do you guys have, how do you guys think about that from a business perspective? A lot of the audience of the show are people who are either running a small business or thinking about starting a small business. And, and I'm, I always try to get like little, you know, tips and tidbits of things that have worked for you that maybe are useful to other people too. Right. Well, um, we've definitely, you know, leaned on the, the big heavy social media areas of, of Facebook and Instagram to get our word out and um, our our friend and bartender, Rachel, um, mm-hmm. she does our daily posts a lot of times. And one of my sound guys, Chris, takes a lot of live shots and posts them into Instagram. So it takes a village. We have a lot of people helping us with our social media. And sometimes I'll, um, you know, do some things where maybe there will be a, a special event and I'll do a little boost um, to make sure that it gets out there. But overall, we just kind of rely on. Have you on seen that pay off? Or? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Where, you know, if it's if it's short term, we haven't promoted a lot um, heavily um, on the back end and it's getting up close and there's only two days before it and it seems like there's not enough interest yet. Then sometimes I can, you know, put 10 or $20 behind it just to make sure that people with those interests yeah. actually see it and, and awesome. know about it. And it really has worked sometimes. Um, okay. So uh, we do it with a limited nature, but um, the social media has worked really well for us. Yeah. Um, and I don't know any real tips or tricks that I could say okay. we do this, but uh, we follow a lot of the you know, guidelines of trying to just keep, the, keep it fresh yeah. and keep, keep more things going all the time so that people are, are wanting to come back and see yeah. what else is going on at D's. And do you guys do merch too or not? Do you sell merch? We do. Okay. <clears throat> I have a merch cabinet over there, and actually, when we're done talking, I gotta drive over and pick up the t-shirts because I have a new round of them. New just round of t-shirts. Yeah, fresh right. round. I got some tank tops and some Boom. new t-shirts done. You heard it first here on the podcast. There you go. <laughs> and you have so you sell t-shirts, hats. You have stickers and stuff like that. No, not yet. I just have the. I just have t-shirts right now. Okay. We were doing a no, no guitar case stickers. No, that, we're gonna get there. It's there on the go. horizon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There was a there was a lot of uh, goals to reach before I expanded my merch because okay. everything costs a lot of money. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've got yeah more cool things for fall as well. And do you guys sell those? Um, do most of them sell to patrons here, or do people order them online as well? Some people call. Yeah. yeah. Some people call. I've been there. I didn't get one when they was there. I was want one in my size. I need one for my girlfriend. Yeah, I get all sorts of calls for That's t-shirts. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Let's talk about something controversial. Okay. So Nashville has this same tension that Austin has, as a lot, a lot of cities have, where you have um, a lot of business, a lot of growth, right? So in Austin, I think the numbers, depending on who you talk to, two or 300 people move there every day. I'm sure Nashville is a, a big influx of people. I think well. it's about 100 people every day, and now it's dropped just below that. Like yeah. it started to slow down a little, not to yeah. say that that's it's slowing down too much. Yeah. It's just started to, so I think it's reached its height. How do you see a city that has such a strong musical heritage where it, it basically depends on art for its identity and, and for lack of a better word. Although Nashville is a little bit different than Austin and that's a much bigger conversation about like the commercial orientation of Nashville. But Nashville sure. also has a very big underground scene for, for music that's not necessarily the mainstream commercial stuff. How do you see the city, you know, we have, and we're talking about gentrification and you're talking about the, how East Nashville has changed and mm-hmm. now uh, Madison. And I'm sure there's some good things about that. You know, more money, more opportunity, more people, uh, more musicians. And it's also really difficult because a lot of times artists and people who haven't necessarily made it huge is they have a tough time affording the cities and, and, and living there. How do you see all this and what, what, are, you, what are you seeing in the front lines here? Well, I know um, for me, I moved to Nashville 11 years ago okay. um, as a songwriter mm-hmm. and um, recently you know, had some success with songwriting, but more just became part of the community here. And I think that's what some people that don't live or haven't experienced Nashville, don't live here, um, don't understand is that even though there's a lot of commercial country that comes out of here, that there's really a live music scene in all different facets. There's a big hip hop scene here, a lot of jazz mm-hmm. and blues and um, we try to foster as many different um, communities within that music as we can. Um, with the with the times that have changed in the last 11 years here, I know that uh, East Nashville is changing. And, and it's funny, I thought of uh, what Elizabeth Cook said the other day. She said it's, uh, it's the Mexit that she's uh, seen where people are leaving East Nashville and coming up to Madison because really they're right up against each other. Mm-hmm. And Madison's just becoming this wonderful place. So as far as what you were asking about, 
um, with with a lot of saturation, I think it adds to the growth because um, what we're seeing is some really amazing music venues that are coming up to Madison too, some big rooms and mm-hmm. uh, like Music City Roots just announced that they're going to move down the street and Yazoo, who's been a wonderful sponsor um, oh, that we keep brewery, on tap. Right? Yeah, it's a wonderful brewery and they just opened up um, right right down the street in like Madison as well. From downtown, I remember. They have one there yeah, okay. and I don't know yeah, if they're... I went there like five years ago. It's vacant now. It's, it's vacant because they moved oh, their headquarters no. up down the road right here, up okay. in Madison. And it's a nice big facility. It's right That's on wild. the Cumberland River. Um, and they've been great supporters of ours. So okay. um, uh, it's just really neat to see what's happening in Madison because Madison used to be in the 70s kind of such a hub for all these country music stars. Yeah. And now it's kind of going through this re- revitalization that's um, really yeah. exciting to be a part of. And yeah. we're kind of right in the heart of it. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, I, I in my experience, like, you know, everybody adapts, like things adapt, things change. And like, you know, it may, may not be exactly as they were before, but they're awesome in a different way. Right. I didn't catch that. No, no, I'm saying they're awesome in a different way, meaning like they, they just because it's not the way it was 10 years ago, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Like you can grow I in a new direction. And that the, the issue, the big issue is affordability. Like how do you keep things affordable enough for artists? Uh, I mean, we have our own strategies here, but I don't think that uh, with the growth in Nashville that those that made Nashville cool and hip, it was just about flipping these houses and, and turning it. So it did push a lot of people out. And the opportunity for affordable housing did move up here, which is why it's helping Madison grow. Yeah. But, you know, we try to keep it, you know, give the each band a, a couple of drinks and it's on the house and try and keep our prices low. So it's, it's affordable for people to be able to hang out and spend time up here. Yeah. Um, but in Madison, you know, Madison has some affordable housing. I don't know that... I, th- I think that they have enough. I think that's a shortage, like, kind of nationwide at, the, mm-hmm. at this point. People are being priced out yeah. of just about everything that becomes kind of cool. Well, but that's the thing, too. I, I've started to see, so uh, during this trip, I also went to Wichita, right? And there's all these cities, like Tulsa is another one, that are, like, kind of up-and-coming artist hubs where a lot of people that, that do want to go to places that are more affordable and they have colleges and things like that that... There, you know, there, there's a lot of cities that end up kind of filling that 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 void, if you will. I don't know. It's it's, I, it's a really complex thing to talk about. I just wanted to get your, your thoughts I, on it. I think you're talking about like like something acting as an incubator, and I think Nashville can definitely be that. You know, it's, as much as you come to town and it's a very saturated scene, yeah. if you have the talent and the drive, then there's ways for you to kind of rise to the top and and find your circles that you can really. Um, be motivated to, um, you know, push yourself to the limit yeah. and see where you stand with some of the, some of the great artists that are around. Yeah. Um, and D's, I feel like I've seen some artists grow just in their time of of playing at D's, you okay. know, and they and they move up kind of through the ranks, so to speak. And yeah. um, there's an artist Ryan Saad that I just can't speak highly enough because I've seen him. I saw him move to town with a f- uh, fresh look, a fresh face. He's he's friends with some of uh, the really great songwriters around here, and he's really not leaned on them at all he's done it on his own to create his own vibe and and i've seen him grow as an artist and and put a band together and and create these um really performances with his solo work that um you know that and and a lot of artists like that where you just see them um use these venues like d's as incubators where they can grow their grow their art and and become an even better artist that's awesome What's uh, if you're gonna manifest anything? What's on your wish list? Who do you want to play here that hasn't played here yet? Oh my goodness! Uh, I'd hate to jinx anything, but uh, well, I I mean Todd Snyder is definitely a hero of mine, and I, I know we look a lot up to him. And he's mentioned playing here, and he's gotten up on stage and done a little bit. But it'd Come be on, fun Todd. to have a little underground bulldogs <laughs> show. Um, there you go. And uh, I mean, honestly, we've had so many of our wish lists kind of come true in a way. Um, so many cool artists. I am still waiting, and I don't know what is taking so long for Sturgill to walk through my front door. Sturgill. Where are you, dude? I'm get get over here. All your friends hang out here, man. Sturgill, get over here. <laughs> I really like. Uh, and bring your wife. She's super cool. A sailor's guide to earth. Actually, I met him uh, the last time I was in Nashville randomly at uh, Carter's, uh, and we talked about this podcast for ten minutes or so. He's a really down to earth guy. Yeah, a really cool guy, and I guess he's just uh, not to try to get off topic too much, but he's releasing some anime movie. Is if that you right? Saw that? Yeah, I have he, no idea. he released the news we can of get that off topic. It's at, at Comic Con just uh, wow. this week. Yeah, at Comic Con. 
he, re- he released he's going to do some anime and something else. Uh, I was reading about it. That <laughs> is wild. <laughs> yeah. All right. Where can people find you? If people are interested in visiting you, if people are interested in finding you on social media, they want, they're, they're in Nashville, they want that authentic country vibe, and they want to drink some old style, where do they go? Well, um, our physical location is at 102 East Palestine Avenue in Madison, Tennessee, just, just right over the line from Nashville. And um, our socials, instead of having to remember D's Country Cocktail Lounge, yeah. um, our socials are D's Lounge 615. Okay, because so 615 D-E-E-S is the area Lounge code. 615 area code. D E E S Lounge 615. And Perfect. so you can find that on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, we look forward to meeting everyone. That is awesome. Well, Amy and. Thank you so much. And Daniel, thank you so much for being on the show. It's uh, really cool to learn about all the cool things that you're doing. Thanks, Pablo. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing you all again. All right, we'll see you Thursday night and Wednesday night too, maybe, huh? Yeah, yeah, Wednesday night. Uh, <laughs> I'll, bring, I'll bring a guitar. So. Awesome. All right. all right, buddy. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. This is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.